What's up, everyone? Joe Carroll here. Excited to be with you guys today because we are getting ready to announce a mixed competition. Insert the applause. <laughs> I know there has been a lot of requests uh, within the uh, Produce Like a Pro community for a new mix competition with some great prizes. So by gosh, that is what we are doing. Uh, Warren reached out to me just a little bit ago and asked if I could find something in my library of artists that I've worked with that would be fun for you guys. Something he His request was primarily a lot of uh, organic, real instruments. He wanted real drums. He wanted acoustic guitar, uh, electric guitars, uh, great vocals, that kind of a thing. So what I came up with is about four or five years ago, a good friend of mine named James Dupre, a fantastic kind of baritone voice. If you recognize his face, uh, if you watch The Voice, he was on Team Adam a few years ago. So that maybe that helps you if you go, I think I recognize that guy. We did a single together four or five years ago, and it was just I just remember it being a ton of fun. Everything just kind of came together. We had a studio full of all-star A-list Nashville session players that do this full-time that you've heard on the radio a million times. They play on a lot of hits from a lot of major, major artists. I think that's one of the most exciting things about picking this track. When you mix this, you're getting to work with, the, you know, the talent that a lot of us don't get to work with very often, just the best of the best in the world. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's just talk about the track just a little bit. It's, it's kind of, a, it's an aggressive country thing. It's country, you know, it's got a banjo. Yes, a banjo. It's got a steel guitar, um, but it's really featured around the vocal and the lead guitar, the electric guitar, is really aggressive and kind of driving the songs to kind of a rock edge. So let's just check it out just, just for a minute. Nothing on this highway but signs and lines and too much time. Changing stations every half a mile But I still don't hear the truth From my point of view The world don't need another love song Too many love songs don't come true The world don't need another love song And I don't need another lie from you It's a banger! I love it. It's, I love it. Um, and, and one thing that was fun, I did have to replace a couple pieces of hardware with software because I had some uh, hardware inserts going at the time, but I just tried to use an emulation of the same thing you know, in the box. So hopefully it's pretty original to what I did four or five years ago. The thing about mixing in the box or, or largely in the box is when you open something up from three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, it's kind of like a time capsule of what you were thinking at the, and the tools you were using at that time. So this has been fun for me to open this up and see. I remember now, I'd forgotten. I was on a real kick. Uh, I had just gotten a bunch of new stuff from Acoustica and the full DSP package, and I was using some plugins that I hadn't used before, and I was, I was, going, I was going nuts with new stuff, so uh, fun memories. Anyway, let's talk about one thing here, because when I opened this song up, and I listened. One thing that struck me right away was the snare drum. It sounds great, but it's so it's just so different than what I would normally do. So here's the primary snare drum, and it's just a tape emulation and a console channel strip emulation. Nothing fancy out at all. Okay, and sample number two. Nothing out of the ordinary, right? Kind of roomy sounding. That's the one I'm using to hit the reverb. The dry, the the main snare is not uh, not hitting reverb at all. Kind of what you expect: some attack and some room, right? This is the one where I'm like, "What in the world was I thinking?" But I, I kind of like it. It's unique. Check it out. Okay, I'm parallel compressing it as well as sending it to some um, distortion. It just kind of brings out a a mid-range nasty honk that I kind of liked within the track. Let me just solo up the drum set as a whole. With and without that sample. Kind of a, almost like a white noise 
you know, like gated reverb kind of thing that it's adding. I don't know. I kind of liked it. And I'm giving you the samples that I used. I can see that I, on the kick drum, I went completely sample. I muted my kick drum, which was odd for me as well. But nonetheless, that's what I did that day. Let's talk about the bass guitar, because I think this is something that's really cool. So this is a great friend of mine, uh, Jacob Lowry, an amazing studio player. Um, you've maybe seen him on the road with Reba McIntyre, Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers, fantastic player. What I was doing was just adding a little tape. I, I wanted to almost pretend like I had recorded this to tape uh, and all to the same same tape machine. So I used this Acoustica plug-in right here that's got a little distortion, let's say, in the upper, upper mids. Uh, and I kind of liked the the aggressive nature that it was adding. It, it's subtle, but it's there. But it's mostly about the tape saturation, of course. As you can see, when you look at the waveform, we went for something that day. We compressed pretty heavily, and we actually added a lot of distortion at the source. So we were going for a thing. And let me let you hear that with just the tape compression. We wanted it to be mean, so Jacob used his Nobles ODR-1. Uh, if you guys are familiar with that guitar pedal, the Nobles ODR-1, he, he was getting the dis distortion from that, and as well as I, I was going into a 1073-style preamp and gaining that up, turning down the trim to get extra uh, harmonics. So you're like, well, that seems like it's awfully compressed. Well, it is awfully compressed, uh, but nonetheless, I'm hitting it with more compression, uh, because I felt like the tone on the bottom couple octaves, like 200 and below, was a, just a little floppy in the mix, and I needed to tighten that up a little bit. So let me play a little before and after, and you'll hear, just pay attention to the, how tight the bottom end is or isn't when I engage the compressor. There, see, the bottom end is just tighter, but it also adds even more distortion. That's why I chose this particular thing from uh, Plugin Alliance, the uh, Acme Opticom. Uh, it, it's got a unique, if you drive it, it's got a unique distortion characteristic of its own. So we were getting uh, that. And so it's a pretty mean, angry sounding bass, almost almost like a rock type of bass. And uh, EQ-wise, is just a tiny bit of upper mid for articulation, reducing just a little bit around 180. Uh, with on Jacob's guitars, that's a kind of a common thing for thing for me. He's got a ton of bottom end, so I almost never add bottom end. Um, that's just you know the source um, that I get from him. Okay, so let's talk about the electric guitar briefly. The electric guitar is really driving this song, and it's one of my great friends, Jeff King, an amazing studio player here in Nashville, always just the Im impeccable tones. And I captured what I did is I captured two mics. And I print them to two separate tracks. As much as I committed on the bass guitar, on electric guitars, I don't like to commit to my blend between my 57 and my ribbon. I like to print them to two separate tracks. Then when it comes to mix, I can decide how much of the ribbon girth that I can stand within the track or need within the track. That way I'm not overly EQing after the, after the fact. I'd just rather print it to two separate tracks. So let me show you the 57s, and I'm going to mute the delays. And I'll just, I'll keep tape on there, but this is the, the 257s, hard left and right. It's an incredible guitar part. So I'll let you decide. Let me, let me bring up the uh, ribbons by themselves and let you kind of hear them. So just not not as much a bright attack and it just just darker. So you can slide that up underneath the 57 if you would like to uh, when you're mixing it and see what you come up with. Now, what I want to talk about real quick is I have two different methods of compressing and uh, treating electric guitars. Well, three actually, because one I don't compress at all. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of times electric guitars just don't need it, but if they do, it's in one of two ways for me. Either I put the compressor before my EQ to tame something that I feel needs tamed prior to me adding uh, my boost on the top just so it stays more in a consistent spot. Or I'm, I'm EQing you know, on an SL, SSL channel strip into a compressor um, so I get that extra smack and that, that thwack. But what I chose to do here 
is compressed before EQ, and I'll show you why. I'll show you what I was doing. You'll see on the right guitar, um, just a couple dB on only above 1K. It's knocking down the attack and the aggression um, just a little bit. So what it's doing is it's taking that anger and containing it just a little bit to where I can follow it with my my beloved SSL 4K and get a little looks like a little 3K and a little 8K um, and it stays in a more consistent spot. So it's I, I'm not actually removing the aggression. I'm making the aggression more consistent from section to section. And here's those two guitars together. And a big part of the guitar sound to me is also the bass because the bass is so distorted. Uh, that's where I'm getting the the full. Uh, you know, they're playing a lot of the, the bass guitar as you heard is in the courses is playing. Um, I guess it'd be eighth notes, and so it's kind of busy along with the electric, and that really rounds out the tone altogether. Very cool. Now, one thing uh, that I remember doing on this track is um, there's, you'll see there's no reverb uh, at all, but there was a little bit of slap delay. Uh, it's not timed. It's just a room slap, uh, probably 15 ips, uh, if I'm guessing. A lot of times, delays. I intentionally make them dark, right? They're, they're, here's the brightness level of the original source, and the delay is a little bit darker because I want it to sound like it came back off of a sidewall, and it's it's just not as noticeable but needed for the depth. I remember that day, yes, it was four or five years ago, but I remember thinking that it wasn't live enough sounding. It just wasn't, it didn't have, you know, I'm, I'm not watching them on stage perform, and that's kind of what I wanted. So I made my delays pretty bright because I wanted it to sound like it was coming off of a hard surface in a smaller club and was just rocking my face off. And let me let me use way too much of it and show you just how bright it was. So it's, it's very bright, you know, so it, that goes against some of the rules that we're taught sometimes when we watch tutorials, but that's kind of the point. There are no rules. Whatever it takes to create the sonic image that we, we hear in our head and that we want to see if we close our eyes, that's what we do. So I just kind of did something uh, out of the box. Now, let's talk about one last thing here, James' vocal, because that is what it's all about. You'll see on most every track here, it was a simple console mix, emulating that it was recorded to tape, coming back through an SSL console, and that is it. A couple choice pieces of outboard, like the uh, Acme uh, Optocomp here. The uh, acoustic guitar is getting a little Neve love with acoustic gold, that kind of a thing. Um, but when it gets to the vocal channel, all of a sudden you see, oh, there's several plugins going. So let's talk about that real quick. So the same tape machine, that same tape machine, but after that... I was going with the dynamic EQ. So there's a couple fixed bands, you know, like the top end boost and uh, the the high pass filter. It looks like a little notch right here, taking some uh, maybe some snottiness out. And, but you'll see there's a couple active ones that's kind of helping keep the tone consistent. Check it out. Don't need another love song. Too many love songs don't come true. The world don't need another love song. And there, there you go. Now, compression-wise, this is a highly musical EQ. So in country music, I don't like to overcompress, even if I compress heavily. And what I mean by that is you use tools that are very musical to where it doesn't sound like a straight-line sausage. So it's up in your face, but it's still storytelling, still punchy. Check it out. Here's the El Rey. Don't need another love song. Too many love songs don't come true. So that's pretty heavy, but metering it's heavy. But sonically, it's not overly heavy. It's it's doing what it needs to do to keep him on track uh, up above this ruckus track. I mean, there's so much going on, it's so thick and dense and muscular that that vocal has to be up there in order to get the storytelling. I was following that for character with a little 1176. Here we go. 
Don't need another love song Too many love songs don't come true Now, because of all that compression, we're starting to get our sibilances coming up, just as always, like we would expect. So I'm following that with a little de here and there, or, or a lot, 10 dB. Here we go. Don't need another love song Too many love songs don't come true And you'll see part of my sound here is the fact that I'm hitting a parallel track. In fact, let, let me just do, let me put the effects back on. And I'm going to mute the parallel compression track, and I'll play the song, and you'll be able to hear where his vocal sets. So I, what I want you to do is be able to hear how much of the parallel compression track is being used to make up the uh, overall vocal level. Okay, check it out. A couple dB. I mean, it's without it, he's not loud enough. With it, he's he's not only loud enough, but it's in your face pretty substantially. And you'll see that the, the de-essing level, if you're going to use parallel compression, one thing to note is your, your sibilance level is highly affected with parallel compression. So, you know, you may have to go in and use a heavier-handed uh, de-essing than you would if you've got it set up for just your primary track and you add parallel compression it's going to bring the sibilance back up so you have to go into your uh, de-essers and kind of set them according to how much parallel compression you are using and that man that's it in a nutshell i mean you can see most of it is very basic uh, tape and channel strip man i mean just just uh, just having a good time letting letting the song just be the song and not get too heavy handed with the mix. Uh, I love it. I had a great time. I think you guys will have a great time too. Remember, s either mix this song as is and send it to us to try to win some great prizes and or take J James' vocal and some other elements and add your own elements and do the alternate thing. You know, turn it into a metal song, turn it into whatever you wanted to turn it into because that's another element of the mix competition. And I'm anxious to see what you guys come up with. Uh, it was fun for me to listen to this again and kind of see what I did four or five years ago. I uh, hope you have a blast with this thing, guys. Happy mixing. Mm -hmm.